welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is From Startup to $31 Billion Behemoth RIA, the catalyst behind the growth of mega firm Serity Partners, and it's a conversation with Serity President Kurt Masinski. I'm Mindy Diamond, and this is Mindy Diamond on Independence. This podcast is available on our website, diamond-consultants.com, as well as Apple Podcasts and other major podcast platforms. If you are not already a subscriber and want to be notified of new show releases, please subscribe right on your favorite podcast platform or on the episode page on our website. For Apple Podcast users, I'd be grateful if you'd give the show a review. Your input helps us to make the series better and alerts other advisors like you who may find the content to be relevant. And while you're at it, if you know others who are considering change or are simply looking to learn more about the industry landscape, please feel free to share this episode or the series widely. There's a quote that says that luck has no role in a successful outcome. But for Kurt Masinski, his meeting with entrepreneur and CEO of Emigrant Savings, Howard Milstein, could possibly be called serendipitous. Because at the time, Kurt was considering leaving his management role at Deutsche Bank, and Howard was looking to make long-term strategic investments in the wealth management space. As a high-profile executive at Deutsche Bank, Kurt certainly had options, but he instead saw the early promise of the RIA and multifamily office model. So in 2009, HPM Partners was born, a firm starting from zero assets and with the backing of investor Howard Milstein. After growing from zero to $9 billion in a decade, private equity firm Lightyear Capital purchased a 50% stake in HPM Partners from Emigrant Bank in January of 2018. A year later, they changed the name of the firm to Serity Partners. And today, Serity manages over $31 billion in assets. Yet behind it all was Kurt's strategic vision to build a sustainable business and attract the most talented people and create a firm operated like a private wealth bank, but with full access to the market so that clients could be served without conflict or limitation. Kurt shares his story with Lewis Diamond, starting with the early stages of HPM through Serity Today. They discuss how Serity competes with other large firms and their key advantages, Plus, he shares his advice for other RIAs who are considering their firm's growth. So let's get to it. Kurt, really excited for you to share your perspectives today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Louis, thank you for having me. Very good. Why don't you tell us about your background real quick? Sure. Well, prior to founding Serity Partners in 2009, I spent 11 years with Deutsche Bank via Deutsche Bank's acquisition of Scudder Investments. I started my career as a financial advisor, working mostly with corporate executives and business owners. But I immediately took interest in understanding all aspects of our business, including systems and processes and financial management and strategy. And that interest led me to business management and leadership roles within our industry. Very succinct answer. I I appreciate that. And um, that leads us to our second question. Obviously, the focus of our show today is hearing you talk about the founding of Serity Partners and what got you to where you are today. So before we get to that, though, um, you were, as you mentioned, a managing director and an executive committee member of Deutsche Bank's private wealth management division, and clearly a very successful executive with a lot to accomplish there. So what led you to leave DB when you did? A great question. Well, although Deutsche Bank was very good to me in a place where I learned much in a very short period of time, I actually came to a few realizations. Uh, First, I felt that clients are best served when your solution set could be the entire marketplace, not simply the products of one firm. Second, I, I wanted to be in the advice business rather than feeling I was in the product distribution business. And lastly, I I wanted to work in an entrepreneurial partnership culture, which I had experienced somewhat early in my career, where you're building something with colleagues and partners and sharing in the excitement of building that. Yeah, that makes sense. And those are all reasons that many of our breakaway guests and executives who have founded 
various firms have mentioned. But I mean, you were you were kind of early to the whole breakaway party. You started Serity in 2009. Back then, it was called HPM Partners. And so it's a time when many brokerage executives hadn't entered the breakaway movement like they have today. And certainly from the advisor side, it wasn't nearly as popular for a successful private wealth team to leave the confines of a major firm to start their own RIA. Um, so what was your thoughts there on striking out on your own and taking the entrepreneurial journey um, kind of early on in this whole evolution? Yeah, although uh, a dozen some years may cloud the specificity of what I was thinking, I'd say generally speaking, that at that time, given my professional experiences and my industry observations, I strongly believed there was a terrific opportunity to build an independent full service wealth management firm that would grow into a leading global wealth management professional services partnership that would be capable of delivering a family office like experience to all private clients that could be done in a very sustainable, scalable and profitable manner. But at the same time, becoming a leader in providing workplace wealth management solutions to companies around the world. And those views were shaped by what I witnessed in the major accounting firms exiting more or less the wealth management uh, business because of the corporate scandal era and recognizing that when the ACO company was acquired by Goldman Sachs, it created a little bit of a void in the marketplace. So a couple of things jumped out at me. One was creating maybe a first of its kind global professional services firm in wealth management, but secondly, becoming a trusted partner to companies around the world. Excellent. And um, let's back up, uh, or not back up, let's fast forward just for perspective. Um, what does Serity Partners look like today from an asset and a headcount standpoint? Sure. So today, from an asset perspective, managing nearly $31 billion for our clients, and we have uh, approximately 250 colleagues of the firm. Perfect. Now let's rewind. So when you launched Serity um, or HPM Partners, as it was called back then, I believe you were aligned with Howard Milstein of the famous New York uh, a real estate family. Can you talk about that relationship and how he either shaped the building of the business or enabled you to do some different things? Yeah, no, I was very fortunate that uh, serendipitously our paths had crossed. At the time that I was considering leaving Deutsche Bank, Howard was seeking to make long-term strategic investments in the wealth management space. You know, his family has been one of the wealthiest families in the country for the past hundred years and has wholly owned one of the largest probably held banks in the U.S. So needless to say, Howard thoroughly understands the needs and the mindsets of wealthy individuals and families. And thankfully, through mutual acquaintances, Howard Office contacted me for a meeting. And given his family's large enterprise, which includes meaningful investments in real estate, I just presumed he wanted to borrow some money from Deutsche Bank. But upon meeting with him, he took me by surprise and made an overture to be a business partner in a wealth management venture. I think after that meeting, I, I floated back to my office on Park Avenue, but shortly thereafter, it inspired me to resign from Deutsche Bank and begin drafting a business plan. And given Howard's, you know, seeking capital and, and general support, you know, I proposed naming the firm HPM Partners, where he is clearly HPM and we would be his partners. And Howard was a terrific angel investor and partner, and he became a, a business mentor and an, almost a business father to me. That's amazing. So it sounded like he was actually part of the catalyst that gave you the confidence and the conviction to go out on your own. Obviously, you mentioned some of the realizations you had about the private wealth capabilities of a global bank with the not having access to the whole market, et cetera. But it sounded like he kind of helped you along. Do you think without him, you would have had the ability or the confidence or the conviction to go and start HPM? I would say definitively, I wouldn't have the confidence to be as bold in my thinking as I was at the time. You know, someone of Howard's background, education, accomplishments, let alone substantial wealth, did fortify my confidence that this could be a venture that would be very successful and that his association with it would lend instant credibility because if someone of his stature was involved with such a business, it would give prospective clients the confidence that we did something that was very good. And it's interesting too, because many of our listeners 
when they're considering breaking away and either founding their own RIA or joining a firm, they're likely bringing a base of clients and portable revenue with them from day one. You kind of want the reverse. It's kind of the old field of dreams. If you build it, they may come. So two questions there. One, how did you even value the business and bringing Howard in if there really wasn't much in the way of assets? And second, how did it feel building a firm from scratch versus having either a platform that you acquired um, day one or having some sort of base to, to grow off of? Yeah, great questions. I would say probably a bit of a throwback model in terms of how we started our business. It truly started with a vision and a strategy for what could be a sustainable, perpetual business. And often in our industry, you know, businesses are not founded that way. Businesses are founded in a very scrappy way of, as you noted, Lewis, individuals saying, hey, there's a better way to do this. Might I put up a shingle? and have a sole proprietorship, and maybe that grows into something bigger, where you know, our day one, we concurrently opened offices in three locations, you know, to contrast what often is done. And I would say having the capital means to bring that vision to life was our experience of, of how we were capable of attracting really talented people that wanted to make sure that if they were going to make a change in their career and leave something that was incredibly stable to them, it would be because they were not running away from something, but running to something. And that something would have been well you know, supported in capital as well as leadership. And I think all those ingredients came together very nicely and enabled us to grow very quickly as a firm. I, I want to say within our first 12 months, we went from startup you know, to over a billion and a half of of AUM because we had a number of talented people, you know, believing in the long-term vision of what we were going to build together. So how did you assemble this eventual group of partners? Was the strategy to acquire businesses? Was it more to recruit or maybe it was more to, to groom folks? What was the strategy day one? The strategy stated day one was to be able to deliver our value proposition of having a full service wealth management firm. And so if you're going to be in the business of delivering estate, financial, tax planning, tax preparation, investment advisory services, you needed a breadth and depth of, of expertise to do that. You know, colleagues who come from backgrounds as former, you know, trust and estate planning attorneys, financial planners, tax advisors, investment professionals. So the strategy you know, day one was recruiting talented people that would want to be part of this effort. Uh, day one, the strategy wasn't how do we roll things up with M&A, but how do we simply you know, put a team on the field that is very capable of providing these services? And for many of us, including myself, there are clients we had worked with that wanted to be part of that and immediately decided to become clients of our firm. But we also you know, had a very good timing, you know, at, at our back here. We launched our firm in the middle of 2009 at the absolute bottom of the last major financial recession. Needless to say, we didn't anticipate a 12-year bull market after we would launch, but the timing was very good. Being an independent business, being supported by someone of, of Howard's stature, you know, having the resources to deliver all of the service we were claiming we were capable of delivering all really served us well. And it allowed us to build meaningful momentum in our first one, two, three years of operation where we were able to go from a startup, you know, to a business that was squarely stable and, and cash flow strong. It's, it's really interesting because many advisors grapple with taking an investor at the jump if they're going to start the business. Of course, taking on an investor de-risks a potential transition and having some capital to grow the business. But many will come back to the fact that if I'm going to start this and do it on my own, I want to own 100% of the business and I want to completely control my own destiny. So it, it sounds like you took the opposite approach and you leveraged the strategic thinking and the expertise and the credibility of a major investor and use that money to hire presumably pretty expensive folks who can provide these types of services. Yeah, absolutely. I think the mindset was a little different because I had professional experiences being at partnerships. Uh, my DNA is around partnerships. So the thought of building something 
with other partners was just more attractive to me. And therefore the goal was just simply build a bigger pie, having a smaller percent of something much larger could be equally, if not more rewarding than simply owning 100% of something that may be much smaller. And so that was the mindset from day one. So I didn't have an ego around, hey, this is Kurt's business, or this is I'm going to own 100% and convince others to come work here, it was how do we create a partnership that could be perpetual? How do you create a business that is bigger than any one person at the firm? How do you create a business that one day could be a global leader? And that was always the vision of our firm to grow into a global professional services firm and to be a leader in what we do. And so that mindset goes well beyond trying to hold on to all the ownership, because if that were the case, if you're not independently wealthy yourself, you would probably be very challenged in, in our marketplace to grow a business and, and allow it to thrive. That's a great segue. So I know in, um, in speaking with you frequently, you often use the term colleague instead of employee to refer to individuals within your firm. And I know it's also a culture, as you just mentioned, of partnership and that there's a pretty unique compensation structure that you have in place. Um, if you're comfortable, can you share a little bit about your thinking around how advisors and employees become partners and high level, um, how you think about compensation for those individuals? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Lewis. I, I would first start by saying words matter and they're important to us. And I appreciate you referencing that. So for example, we're a firm. We're not a platform. We don't reference ourselves as a company, organization, a firm. As you said, we don't feel we have employees. We have colleagues and partners. We have clients rather than having cases you know, or other deals or terminology. And so these words are very important culturally to us of how we build. But since we think of ourselves as this thriving partnership, partners you know, need to fairly share in the success of the firm, both the cash flows of the firm as well as the equity of the firm. So we target, you know, a percentage of our firm's revenue to create cash flow pools that get allocated to the partners of the firm. And that enables them to think and act like true business owners and partners of the firm and empowers them to use their allocation of the firm's cash flow to share with other colleagues with whom they wish to work to develop and serve clients, but also to make sure they have the other colleagues they need around them to do the things that are required to be successful in our business. And by empowering them to do that, we feel it's just a much more rewarding profession uh, because if your partners, partners have the ability to, to think and act like a business owner. And then we carry that same concept you know, to how we share in the firm's equity. Everything we do in our firm is based on meritocracy. So people have absolute control of not only their professional fulfillment within our firm, but they have control over the economic fulfillment. And so for those partners you know, who are driving the growth and the profitability of the firm, they will continue to receive growing cash flow and growing allocations of the firm's equity because they are most meaningfully contributing to the growth of the value for all shareholders. So that has served us very well. Uh, since inception, and you know, not to say that through time you can't refine or tweak you know things on the edges, but that core concept and core principles of of how we build our firm together, you know, is the glue of our partnership. Yeah, and I think it, again, it comes back to what you said about wanting to have a smaller piece of a much more valuable pie rather than clinging to every, every decile of, of equity possible. Um, and it's, it's really interesting to hear your viewpoint on it because many RIAs, they'll just have a high payout, but a founder, a group of founders owns all the equity. Others, like we've had Rush Benton from CapTrust on here, everyone in the firm, including the receptionist, is an equity owner. And it's not that there's one right or wrong way. It goes more to what an advisor or a, a firm who's looking to sell is seeking, in your case, a partner, and it defines your culture clearly. Yeah, we very much share those those principles and you know, very much resonates to me with what you said, you know, Rush had shared with his firm. Perfect. So earlier you mentioned the multiple lines of business that Sarity has. 
I would call it family office services at its core. So things like tax preparation, obviously financial planning and asset management, estate planning, et cetera. But you also have a relatively meaningful institutional business, more institutional consulting. How do all these pieces fit together? Sure. So I start by saying everything we do as a firm is wealth management. And our mission from day one and inception has been to positively impact the financial well-being you know, of our clients and provide a family office-like experience to them. So accordingly, we need a breadth of capabilities to deliver that value proposition. And among those things is estate financial and tax planning and tax preparation we do a fair amount of personal financial administration for our clients and, of course, investment management. But by having those capabilities, we're able to bring those areas of expertise together and to deliver a very powerful workplace wealth management solution for leaders of companies who have a fair amount of complexity in how they're creating their own wealth with compensation and set of equity programs and broader benefit plans that companies are putting in place for them. So we've become experts. Many of us here at the firm have started our careers at big public accounting firms, or for example, the ACO company, where we were trained you know, in, in a great deal of precision of how to understand those issues and render quality advice. So you know, these executives and leaders could take most advantage of what a company is putting in place for them in creating their wealth and to integrate that you know, with their personal financial and tax planning. So that's become a powerful component to what we do as a firm. And that naturally led us to being a trusted partner with companies. And as we became experts on companies overall, you know, comp and benefit plans, we became experts on things as basic as their retirement plans, both qualified for a profitable or for-profit company rather, that would be a 401k plan or for a nonprofit, it could take different forms. But then we became advisors to those plans since we were helping their leaders, you know, figure out how do they take advantage of them. And this then started to grow hand in hand, but we deem everything we do is wealth management, whether we are managing a company's qualified or non-qualified retirement plan or personalizing the advice and service to individuals within the company, we all deem it to be part of the broader wealth management solution. And it sounds like too, from day one, you've known who your core client is and everything you've built around it is in support of either providing more comprehensive services to this corporate executive clientele or to expand your, your roster of executive clients. Agreed. That's exactly correct. Very cool. And you made reference a couple of times to the ACO Corporation, which is now part of Goldman Sachs. And we've also seen companies like Morgan Stanley run extremely hard into what they would call the workplace wealth management space with their acquisition of Solium and of E-Trade. What do you think is Cerity's edge against, obviously, these global behemoths who have brand names that um, are going to resonate likely more than Cerity? But how do you compete for clients against the likes of Morgan or Goldman Sachs ACO? Sure. Another good question. Well, ACO and Morgan Stanley have meaningful presences in the workplace wealth management space, as, as you identified. And while I cannot fairly speak to all their practices, I believe the differences you know, have remained the same and as follows. That first, you know, we serve as a fiduciary to our clients. We're always placing their interest first. We do that by our regulatory registration and we do that by our client agreement. And I think that is kind of the first key point of differentiation. I mean, we, we are not seeking to put ourselves in a position of, of conflict. Second, we do not sell products of any nature to our clients and we have the freedom to use the best solutions offered in the entire marketplace without marking up the cost of those solutions. Our job is to not only advise our clients as to what they should do, but help them get the solution they need to affect our advice. And having the freedom to use every capability in the marketplace is incredibly powerful, not simply you know, the products of, of one organization. And, and last, we do not have corporate investment banking activities that may pose information confidentiality risks or restrictions. You know, if you are working with either ACO or Morgan Stanley and you're working with the executives, 
you know, the company may be using an investment banking advisor that's different than those companies. And that potentially creates confidentiality issues, you know, by crossing over that barrier. So we do not have, you know, those characteristics. And I believe based on some of those key differences, and it's what our corporate clients tell us. So these differences are not just what we believe, but it's what companies have informed us as to why they selected us. You know, that's how we seek to compete against those companies, um, even though they are you know, big companies with big brands and, and much capability. Yeah, that's a really good explanation. And how about on the capability side? What are, let's say, two examples of a solution or a service or even access to a product that, you, that Serity has um, access to differently than either... Um, but when you're at, at Deutsche Bank on the private wealth side, or that you can imagine an ACO or a Morgan Stanley are able to do for their clients? Yes, yeah, so I'll give you I'll give you a couple of examples. I can't say these examples perfectly hold true for ACO, Morgan Stanley, any particular institution, but given my experiences working at one of the largest global investment banks, I, I think you'd likely see this more often than not. If you are employed by a global investment bank and a client has a credit need, and by the definition of you being a global bank, you have a balance sheet. And when you are the lender to a client, as a lender, you often are seeking the highest interest rate possible, the most amount of covenants, the most amount of collateral, and the best terms possible. When you're an independent advisor to a client, you think in the opposite format. If you view yourself as an extension of your client's family, you would seek to try to get your client a loan with the best interest rate, with the least amount of covenants, with the least amount of collateral. It's a different approach. If you are lending money to a client, often you don't inform your clients if you then lend money to other clients with a similar credit profile, and you gave them better terms, you call back your other clients and say, hey, we just want to you know, give you better terms because we provided better terms recently to other clients. These, these things don't happen. As an independent advisor, that is exactly your responsibility and duty as a fiduciary, that we know the marketplace. And if we know there's better terms, we immediately seek to get our clients the better terms and better solutions. So that's, that's a key difference when you don't have products to offer your clients, but instead finding the best products and services in the marketplace you know, for your clients. On the investment front, in some regard, the same could hold true if you have proprietary products and capabilities. The joke has always been, it's hard to fire yourself. It's hard to say, hey, we're not performing well, therefore we're going to fire ourselves and let you seek investment management elsewhere. But however, a lot of the global investment banks you know, have moved into a more open architecture model, but an issue now is becoming with the global investment banks of their size. You know, Morgan Stanley, nearly two, you know, 20,000 financial advisors and Merrill Lynch and UBS, you know, Merrill Lynch pretty close to Morgan Stanley, UBS maybe a little bit smaller. I share those as examples because when they seek to find in third-party investment manager solutions, many cases for boutique or niche managers or terrific alternative investment managers, they may not be seeking to raise billions of dollars of assets. They may want to simply raise something smaller and therefore becomes challenging going to those institutions because those institutions, if they get access to something, want it available for everyone. And if they don't want it available to everyone, then how does that work with their clients? How do they only provide access to unique things to only certain clients, but not all their clients. So being a firm that is more nimble and being a firm that it does not need to play to a, a low common denominator allows independent firms much greater flexibility and latitude and often better access to solutions you know, for clients because not being encumbered by having to figure out how does this solution you know, benefit 100,000 plus clients. So when you put all that together, you know, independent wealth management firms can compete very effectively against big global investment banks for these reasons. That's one of the clearer and better explanations of shopping the street or true open architecture that I've heard. So I very much appreciate that. Oh, thank you. Let's pivot to 
Cerity's inorganic growth. So mergers and acquisitions has been a major avenue um, for Cerity. Having announced, I don't even know the number, but some very impressive transactions, such as a $3 billion merger with EMM Wealth in New York and a $1.1 billion merger with Banco in Boston. Can you talk about your motivation for M&A and how it might be similar or different from some of the other acquirers that are in the marketplace right now? Sure. Well, we've we've used mergers as an effective means of deepening our expertise, uh, expanding our geographic presence, and enhancing our capacity for organic growth. As I said earlier in this discussion, you know, words are very important to us. We never view we acquire anyone, colleagues or clients. We merge. And by coming together, we create a better partnership. Always felt that we've been better as a firm with our new colleagues than without them. So that's very important for cultural integration and making sure we're going to build one strong, unified firm. Now, we are not a loose confederacy of colleagues. We don't deem we're a roll-up business, a consolidator, or an aggregator. These are terms that I often try to say we, we are not those things. And although I cannot you know, fairly comment on the strategies of other active acquirers, I suspect some of them are proud aggregators and consolidators and are you know, simply seeking the scale. We want to be this one strong, unified partnership. And if you look at leaders of other professional services areas, such as accounting firms, be it a Deloitte or Pricewaterhouse or KPMG or Ernst & Young, or management consulting firms like uh, McKinsey, Bain, Boston Consulting, for the big global law firms, you know, you put like a Kerboth or Skadden Arps as you know premier law firms. You know, these are firms no one would ever say, "Are you a consolidator? Are you an aggregator? Are you rolling up?" But if you take a look at the histories of many of those firms I just mentioned, you know, it's a hundred, hundred fifty, or hundred fifty year plus histories of a number of mergers. And those mergers have lent well, you know, to those professional services firms, expanding their presence and deepening their expertise and having capacity for organic growth. And we view mergers as our way of also doing that. Yep. Another enlightening answer. How about on the topic of external investors? We've talked about the initial partnership with Howard Milstein and relatively recently with private equity giant Lightyear Capital. How do you view private equity as a catalyst for your business? And what was the thinking behind moving from one investor to another versus maybe taking the company fully fully out of an investor's hands or even going public? Yeah, sure. Well, I first start by saying just external capital. Always view external capital has helped us accelerate our vision and strategy. You know, in, ten, in just 10 years, we went from startup to one of the largest independent wealth management firms in the country. Having capital resources to do that is ultimately what enables you to do that in that kind of short time frame. Now, furthermore, I, I, I think our external capital partners have lent much value other than capital. They've helped provide credibility at various stages. For example, having a partner like Howard when you're a startup wealth management firm trying to serve ultra high net worth clientele. You know, that establishes credibility. You know, he provided insight to the perspectives of very wealthy people. Uh, but then when we move to growth capital, you know, Lightyear Capital has been an exceptional partner and they provide insight to the marketplace. But in both cases, with Howard and Lightyear, it also accelerated the professional limb of the business. When you have external shareholders, you're not only held to the standards or the expectations of your partners who are in the business managing clients, but you have a responsibility and accountability to external shareholders, which I believe you know, promotes greater professionalism, greater transparency, uh, better decision-making, you become better stewards of capital. Perfect. And how about the word scale? So that's a, a buzzword to many that firms need to gain scale, and it's a race for scale. What does scale mean to you, and how can Cerity help a firm that feels like it's not at scale? Sure. Well, first, to me, scale is the ability to optimize your efficiency, your effectiveness, your profitability. And with scale, you can afford to have colleagues who are specialized in activities versus small firms often 
you know, people are wearing four, five, six, seven hats. It's not unusual to see an independent RIA that's small where the founders, the CEO, CIO, head of compliance and other roles. And as I think many people would, would honestly acknowledge when you're wearing many hats, you're likely not performing at your peak at each hat and things tend to give. So scale provides the specialization. Specialization then provides greater advancement for a business, but it also transcends to technologies to enhance your productivity, marketing half to drive systematic organic growth. And then most importantly, scale provides leveraged on your fixed cost, which increases profitability. So those things to me are what scale means. No, we are able to help bring that to new colleagues because many times colleagues join us, whether it's through a merger or simply they join us because they left another firm and, and wanted to be a, a partner or a colleague of our firm, that we're able to have them focus on the things that they love and that they excel at, often being great client advisors. Furthermore, we have the resources to help accelerate organic growth. You know, we believe that if being a great firm means colleagues don't feel that they're on an island and that if they can't figure out how to you know, solely source the next client opportunity, they can't grow. And so we have many ways in which we, as a firm, invest to create prospective client opportunities for our colleagues throughout the firm. It's things as basic as custodial referral programs, to having regional and national partnerships with other firms that don't do what we do, we don't do what they do, but they like what we could do for their clientele. We're increasingly investing in our direct and digital you know, marketing efforts, which are sourcing new business opportunities. And what this is enabling us to do is to provide growth opportunities for all of our colleagues. So our, our motto is leave no one behind, you know, let high tide raise all ships here in the firm, but the goal is to help everyone achieve their optimal you know, professional fulfillment. And, and that will include being able to serve more clients and being able to create a better personal wealth creation event for themselves. Outstanding. And how about on the topic of valuations? From where I said, it, it seems like valuations are on the rise. And maybe some would say there's a bit of a bubble in the M&A market. What's your viewpoint on this and how have you seen either valuations or deal structures change um, since you've uh, become an active acquirer yourself? Uh, I can definitely confirm valuations have increased over the past couple or few years. I would also note that uh, not only valuations have increased, but the amount of those valuations up front have also increased versus amounts that potentially be paid in, in future years upon coming together. And I believe valuations are a function of many things, including absolute value, depending on the specific circumstance of, of the business and, and their growth and their capacity, but also relative value. Uh, and then you also have the dynamic of supply and demand dynamics. But after the last financial recession, wealth management became an instant beacon for stability in the financial services sector. Generally speaking, wealth management businesses have fairly stable and predictable revenue and cash flows. And those attributes have become very appealing to investors of all types, be it private equity firms, large financial services firms who are already in the business of, of providing financial services, obviously, but also wealthy individuals and, and other investor profiles. And I think all of that interest has driven valuations higher. I suspect those valuations will, will stay here for some bit of time, but until there's other relative value opportunities that can provide that same level of predictable, stable revenue and cash flows, I think valuations will remain high. Do you think it's justified? Well, justify is the eye of the beholder, but it depends on the specific firm. If you're meeting with a firm who has had explosive organic growth and there doesn't appear to be anything slowing down that organic growth, they could be you know, very, uh, very fairly valuated at a, at a higher valuation. You know, if you are meeting with a firm that has had very modest growth or maybe even net outflows, you know, higher valuations are, are not justified. There's other dynamics outside of growth rates, but growth rates are generally one of the key drivers of value. 
as you be willing to invest you know more in a business that is going to generate you know more economic potential than one that doesn't last question for you what's your vision for Saturday and where does it go from here well, we want to continue to build our leadership position in the U.S., but we've always had a vision of expanding globally. So I believe our next chapter will be you know, how do we thoughtfully enter into new markets outside the U.S. and continue to build on our vision of being a global professional services firm in wealth management and possibly becoming a first of its kind. Love it. Kurt, thank you so much for sharing some of your tips I especially enjoyed your candor around your business model and just how you think a truly independent, fiduciary-minded wealth manager can stand out versus some of the more global investment bank uh, competitors. So thanks again and look forward to the next time. Great, Lewis. Thank you for having me. Kurt had a strategic vision that to this day drives the continued growth of the firm. But it was his designs for attracting the right talent and building a culture that individuals felt invested in and that they were not running away from something, but instead to something that really is the fuel behind the firm's astounding success. I thank you for listening. And I encourage you to visit our website, diamond-consultants.com and click on the tools and resources link for valuable content. You'll also find a link to subscribe for regular updates to the series. And if you're not a recipient of our weekly email, Perspectives for Advisors, click on the blog link to browse recent articles. These written pieces are an ideal way to stay informed about what's going on in the wealth management space without expending the energy that full-on exploration requires. Feel free to email or call me if you have specific questions. I can be reached by cell at 973-476-8578 or by email at mdiamond at diamond-consultants.com. Please note that all requests are handled with complete discretion and confidentiality. And again, if you enjoyed this episode, feel free to share it with a colleague who might benefit from its content. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcasts app, I'd be grateful if you gave it a store rating and a review. That will let other advisors know that it's a show worth listening to. This is Mindy Diamond on Independence.